Rob Doster here. I got Jeff Goodman with me. Hell no. John Fink. Are we still live? Feel the 68 till I die. Give it to you. I'm sorry, man. I blacked out. Randolph children. DJ Khaled. You know the big DJ Khaled guy? Hands broke up and in. Goodman needs to be fired all the time. Josh Tasker. You're going to beat people straight up. You know the deal. They have no swag. They have no nothing. Terrell McNeil. From the bluest of the blue bloods to the smallest of the mid majors. This is Field of 68. After Dark. Hello, welcome in to Field of 68 After Dark here on a Wednesday night, the March 27th, 2024 edition of the show, which of course means it is uh, the, the eve of the Sweet 16 kicking off this week in the NCAA tournament. We got a ton to get to. We got coaching hirings to touch on. We're going to preview uh, the games that are going on on Thursday. Uh, so a lot to get to here on the show. I'm John Martin hosting tonight with my guys, Jarrell McNeil and Randolph Childress. Good to be with you guys. As always, we're on SiriusXM, YouTube, X, Facebook. We're going to be on Last Call, exclusively on Stadium, in about an hour. Uh, as always, you guys, I mean, it's March. If y'all don't know the drill by now, what are we doing? Send the questions in. We'll answer them uh, after the show over there on Last Call. So, pack show today, as always. But let's kick it off with the news of the day before we get into the Sweet 16. That's Pat Kelsey uh, leaving Charleston, College of Charleston, after two straight NCAA tournament appearances. He's headed to Louisville. RC, this is uh, this is your league, my friend. This is the Atlantic Coast Conference. Um, Jeff Goodman gets the story in the news there that Pat Kelsey is going to be the next coach. What do you make of the hire for Louisville? First off, I, I like Pat. I know Pat. I, I think Pat will do a really good job. Um, I'm cheering for him. I mean, he's – He's been a high major coach for quite some time, so he's turned down opportunities to go other places. I, I, I would be interested to hear what he says of why he chose to take Louisville. Um, you know, he's had a couple. He's been in the mix for a bunch of other jobs. My, you know, having said that, my question would be: I, I really want to know what was the process like for Louisville. You know, you had mm. so many names associated with that, and. Pat wasn't one of them. And sometimes that's just what it takes. Sometimes these things are just dumb luck, you know, whether that person is second, third, fourth, fifth on your list, whatever they are. But yep. um, this one came out of nowhere. I, I'd be interesting to see. We'll never find out. They'll never be honest with you. But we also know that, that Dusty Mays had the opportunity. They, they were just just a few other guys that we heard, whether it's true or not. Um, just be curious to see how that but either way now, we know it's his. So congratulations to Pat. You know, I'm cheering for him. I know he'll do well. Jarrell, what do you think of the fit there? Uh, I actually like the fit. I actually like the fit, John. Uh, I mean, I think Kelsey is kind of the Jota energy that that, uh, that that program might need right now. He's, uh, like R.C. said, he's kind of proven himself. Obviously, he's been a, a high major level coach, uh, and, he's, and he's won everywhere that he's been. Uh, he showed that he's he's able to dominate kind of and get his teams, uh, some of the smaller mid-major teams into the NCAA tournament uh, on a consistent basis at multiple different stops. So uh, the, the resume is impressive. Uh, he obviously kind of took his time before he moved on and jumped up to a high major. Uh, but I think this would be a good fit for him ultimately. Uh, and, you know, just like RC said, it was just kind of weird the way throughout the process, hearing all the different names, and then we end up on Pat Kelsey. Uh, I read something earlier today, and I don't know how true it is, but that uh, that church from Indiana State got offered it as well, too. Uh, so, like he said, just funny the way things kind of work out. But uh, ultimately, I think it'll be a good fit. Uh, and I think he'll actually have a shot to do well there and try to turn the program around and get him going in the right direction. Yeah, RC, it went from, you know, Dusty May. It went from Dusty May to Schertz to, to now Pat Kelsey. I don't know. I guess if you'd have just sort of asked me blindly, um, you know, in January, how how good a job is Louisville and what kind of candidate can they attract? I maybe would have aimed a little higher. I'm not saying it can't work. I'm not saying it won't work. I'm just saying if you'd have just asked me that, I would have thought the pool would have been. It never really felt like Dusty May was was going to take it, especially when Michigan came open. I just, I guess, I would have thought maybe the the, the pool would have been a little deeper. Uh, it, what do you make of that? Is that just because of the struggles of Louisville? It was the pool fine, and I'm just off base here. Like, what what did you make just of the of the profile of candidate 
that was linked to this job before landing on Kelsey? Uh, again, I'll say this about Pat. I, I think it's a good choice with Pat. I really like Pat. I think he's a really good coach. I think he's adjusted and, and been around. I've been around him and we obviously know similar people. He was at Wake Forest for a while and before he went off and became a head coach and he's done a hell of a job, man. I mean, he's, he's had guys like Justin Gray, who's, who's at Coastal Carolina. He brought him along. Uh, he's also been there with Chris Mack. You know, he he has he's going to know the inside secrets and and traits of everything with Louisville because Chris Mack was there, so he can find out what he should do, what he shouldn't do. He'll learn a lot of things from from uh, his relationship with with Mack to for the job. I, let me say this with this job, I, I think it's and I think this has. I wondered if this situation has something to do with the Kentucky situation, and what I mean is. A lot of times, a lot of people, all you you always associate this job and say it's it's so great and, and and it is a great job, but there's a lot that comes with that. And when Louisville, over the last two years, finds themselves in situations like they did, some coaches don't want to deal with that. Mm-hmm. They don't, and I think that sometimes mm-hmm. you see, you know, they obviously, I think it's fair to say it. I've been on record of how I feel about Pat it's fair to say that he wasn't the top person on their list and guys are turning you down for this to be a job. If we would have ranked this job and you were to say, Oh man, Louisville ranks what's top 10 top eight. It's definitely considered probably a top 10 job in college in college athletics. You would have no, no one would ever say Michigan's a better basketball job than Louisville. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think anybody, if you rank that outside. I know big 10 people, obviously Michigan feels that way. Besides right. all that. No, I mean, that's, they, you're right. I mean, the history, you know. Pretty, pretty steady, but you see coaches turning the job down. That that just tells you right now that some guys are just like, man, I don't want to deal with that. Like, I don't want to deal with the scrutiny and everything that comes with that job. And I, I think that has, even with Kentucky, you know, like how many guys, if, if Kentucky had moved on from Kyle, how many people, because these jobs don't want the mid-major guy, they feel like, man, outside of these other blue bloods, this is the job you want. You're going to want to come here and take this job. And coaches now are like, man, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to sit there and deal with those expectations where the funny thing about it is now is so much of the blue bloods and the tradition, a lot of these schools are holding on to tradition and they haven't even adapted to the, to the times of today. They still right. catching up on NIL and doing all the other stuff, but you're hanging on to your tradition about what you are, and, and the game has changed so much now. And I think that's one of the right. reasons why some of our blue bloods have struggled, you know, in recent times. Then then people think because of that. So, man, I, I let you, I let you guys go because I've been kind of going on that a little bit, but that's just how I feel about it. I think sometimes you hold on to these jobs, you think that they're, you think you're greater than what people on the outside think you are. And when you go mm-hmm. to say, hey, we'll Louisville, we can go get this guy. And guys are like, nah, I would have never thought a guy would turn down Louisville and go to Michigan. Never. Yeah, uh, I think sometimes you're, <clears throat> you know, you get humbled a little bit uh, in times like this. You know, it happens quite a bit. I've seen it up close and personal. Uh, Jarrell, Louisville has not been to an insulin tournament since 2019. Now, they were going to make it in the COVID year. Uh, There's no doubt about that, but that tournament didn't happen. So it's been since 2019 that Louisville was in the NCAA tournament. So is that just sort of for Pat Kelsey coming in? I mean, that's the obvious and the immediate goal, right, is to just restore, you know, that credibility because it's been so long for that program. Yeah, I think I think ultimately it'll go it'll go in steps. Um, The first step is just going to make them a competitive unit again. Uh, and, I, and I don't think he'll have an issue with that. Uh, being at Louisville, kind of his makeup as a coach, what he's done in other spots, I think he's proven that he'll get guys in, his kind of guys in uh, right away, especially with the amount of resources and thing that Louisville has. Uh, where they'll, they'll be a competitive team uh, right away, probably coming in the next year. Uh, I'm not 100% if, they'll, if that'll turn right into NCAA tournament berth right away. But I think that's clearly the second step of it is getting back to the dance to a point where they're they're actually in the dance and in the field at the end of the year and they're playing meaningful basketball uh, around this time of the year in March. So I think he'll crush yeah. it, John. I really do. I think he's – if you know Pat, 
the energetic guy. He knows one screen this, man. Trevor. One screen. Here we go. One screen for yeah, RC. Put it down. I'm a big fan of Pat. I think Pat will crush it. Uh, some, he may not have been their first choice, but uh, no one will work harder than he will. He, he, he won't get there and, and, and rest. I mean, he will grind and grind his ass off to make sure that, that he's successful. So um, interesting to see. I would imagine there's more spots that he can add to his staff. I'd be curious mm. to see what else he does, who he adds, and, and, and things of that nature. Does one of his assistants stay behind and get that job, you know, College of right. Charleston job? Um, so there's a lot to see with that. But I, I, I have full faith that, that Pat will get it done. They may He may not have been their first choice, but he may ultimately be their best. Yeah, I'll I mean, say, dude, I'll I'm say not, this, too, just right now. So. Say again? I'll, I'll say this, too, just circling back to that. To that point, RC made early. I think the dynamic has changed too, man. Just based off of, uh, you know, universities have become a lot more impatient with the portal and stuff too. Like, you know, what I mean, like if you get a job like Louisville, with the resources that they have, with the fit it is for him, you just don't have as much time. So I think that might be some of, the, you know, kind of the way that that's scaring some of these other top coaches off a little bit too. Is that if they don't have a you know, a short-sighted vision of how they can make it work right away uh, within the first two to three years, then I think that's, you know, it's, it's kind of scaring them away. It's like, well, you know, this this is a full-on rebuild. I got to build it up. It's going to turn over right away. I got to fi- fix that type of stuff. Like, if they don't have a, a clear shot or a clear window where they're like, I can win here and get into the NCAA tournament and buy myself some more time, at least with the fan base. Because like you said, man, just the expectations for some of these so-called blue blood programs and things like that, it's off the charts. And, and now in a place like Louisville, there are no excuses. I mean, what was it, two years of, of KP on the job? And you know what I mean? And it, it, it ended it all out, you know what I mean? Almost, almost a coup, you know what I'm saying? They almost ran them out of town down there. So it was like, man, you you don't got a lot of time, man. It, 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 there are no excuses when you have some of these jobs. So you got to put up a shut up right away. So you better have a, a vision and a plan in mind to make it work quickly. Yeah, no question. And RC, I was just saying, I'm I'm not my wife's first choice tonight. So <laughs> I, I don't know. It may not be working anymore. Hey, bro. Uh, hey, bro. Uh, I can relate. I can relate. I understand, man. Sometimes we gotta get in. We, you know, what I mean, we gotta. We some. There's a lot of dudes out there lying, thinking they were their wives' top choice. Man. We just, <laughs> just get in, get in, and go along for the ride, and make the best of them. Make them know they made the right choice. Think that's something we can all relate to. <laughs> man, man, when this show is over, when this show is over, my wife's in there. She, she's feeding the one month old. I'm going to look at her. I'm going to say, this is what RC told me to tell you. I might not be your first choice, but I'm your best choice. That's what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> hey, you better do that. She in there making bottles and stuff for you sitting around here hey. sipping on stuff. Talk about you working. She don't want to hear that. You better take that oh, baby yeah, and no, feed I'm, I'm working hard, man. I really am, man. This is hard work right here. All right, uh, before we get to, uh, to break here, I want to stay in your conference, RC. You've been busy, man. Your league's been busy. Uh, Andy Enfield is leaving USC for SMU. They fired Rob Lanier after a 20-win season, which still feels crazy to me. Uh, but they do hire Andy Enfield, who may be, you know, getting out a little bit ahead here. Uh, what do you think of this move for SMU going with Enfield here and, and uh, you know, obviously moving on from Lanier? I, I'm going to be clear about the, the Lanier uh, firing. I don't like it, and I don't understand it. I, I, a guy, the guy won 20 games in his second year. Your SMU basketball, cut it out. Like, cut it out. Absolutely. Like, you put a gun, Absolutely. you put a gun to my head. I couldn't name five players in the history of your program. Cut it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm just being honest. I asked you guys the same thing. Name me five sure. players in the history of SMU no, basketball real. program. And uh, you I, I got Keith Frazier, Henry Davis. You make the, listen, <laughs> I, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Who you got? Well, I got I got Keith Frazier, Keith Frazier, uh-huh. Kendrick Davis, Those uh, the two I had. Moody A. Moody A. Don't forget Moody A. Uh, yeah, Moody was there. Oof. 
Oh, man. man. Hey, the I'm show going to be over, bro. Let's keep going. We ain't got time to be waiting. You just validated my point is all you did. I I, I, we, I, I was being sarcastic, but I'm just – but you get, you get along with what I'm saying. Like, you, you, you go along with it. My, my point is that, listen, Andy has done a hell of a job. I mean, I will say, listen, he, he can – I wonder why he's leaving USC. He, he, he's proven he can get guys there. I don't know the dynamics of it. It's nothing against him, his staff, or anything at USC. Uh, but I just don't like the way the Lanier firing. I, I, that, that's just where I am. And it, it makes it hard for me to come around on anyone else right away because I just, it, you know, he's a, I, because I know he's a stand up guy. And when it happened, yeah. I had people calling me questioning his character mm. and his integrity. And I'm like, that's BS. So that was my issue with mm. it at all. Uh, I wish yeah. Andy the best, and I'm glad Lanier got the right job and he can land on his feet and build that program up. But that's BS to me. I, I don't get it. Yeah, Jarrell, I mean, you were talking about expectations, um, you know, for Blue Bloods. SMU woke up and decided it was a Blue Blood, apparently. Yeah, I mean, and they were dead ass wrong for that. But, uh, like you know, just like RC spoke to, I'm just glad that – you know, obviously, it was it wasn't a long sit for him. He got another job right away because somebody else saw the value in what he was doing. So at the end of the day, when you're dealing kind of with uh with management or people that's the decision makers are are doing stuff like that, you're probably better off anyway getting out of there. So uh, uh and I and I'm guessing that Enfield uh probably saw some a shit storm coming his way as well too in USC. So- <laughs> So obviously, uh, it's about to be a mass exodus there with guys entering the draft and stuff too. So he he cut uh, he cut ties and got out of there as well. No doubt. Hey, we uh, had a very busy day in the transfer portal, uh, so we'll get into that. Also, uh, Charlie Baker had some super interesting comments about the future of college sports. Ask these guys about it when we get back. Field of sixty eight after dark. The best month of the year is here, which is why you need to know that we are partnered with BetMGM. We'll be using BetMGM lines for making all of our picks and predictions, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, you can use bonus code FIELD, and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM. Here's the best part. All you need to do is deposit and bet $10 of your hard-earned money to get it. This is what you have to do to make it work. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using that bonus code FIELD. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. You'll get up to $1,500 in bonus bets if your bet loses. Just make sure you use that bonus code FIELD when you sign up. Most importantly, we have some fun stuff coming up for the rest of the NCAA tournament. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops odds boost, and the thing that I love the most, a nice little parlay boost, as well as a ridiculous array of prop bets for anything that you could possibly imagine betting on. From odds on getting to the Final Four to national championship futures, I'm calling it right now. Bet MGM is the king of the prop bet. So go download the Bet MGM app. Use that code FIELD and sign up today. And while I've got you a quick request, the best way to support the Field of 68 content you get for free is to engage with us. Rate and review the pod in any podcast app. Like and share the YouTube videos that you enjoy. Tell your friends about us. It all helps in a world where the algorithm is king. And now, back to the show. Welcome back, Field of 68 After Dark. Uh, here on Sirius XM, uh, here on YouTube X, Facebook, uh, we'll be on Stadium uh, exclusively here in about 40 minutes. So if you've got some questions that you have for either one of these guys, uh, certainly get those in and we'll answer them in full detail uh, in about 40 minutes. So uh, anyway, we'll get to that. Hey, one last uh, coaching thing I wanted to get to, RC. Uh Coach John Calipari and his AD were side by side tonight um, and seemed to sort of be in, you know, I don't know if you'd call it lockstep, but certainly publicly it looked like, you know, everything was cool. Uh, you know, as, a, as somebody that's been a coach and maybe not necessarily in that situation, like is Cal kind of gritting his teeth behind the scenes that like there he's having to go out in public or is it just a deal where – He's like, yo, I'm made no matter what. So whatever this dude says, I'm just going to roll with. Listen, it's – Kyle is 
one of the all time greats, man. Let's 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 not. I, I would never seem to be. I, I don't want to seem disrespectful. I've made comments about it, um, but the reality is something has to change, and it's just Coach Cal. And, and and what I mean is not necessarily saying even for him as a coach, but what something has to change there. It it it's it's the if it's the construction of a roster. I'm not saying. Um, not to recruit freshmen. I think he has to do that, but he also has to figure out a way to how that mix goes. Um, offensively, what he is it something that he can do offensively? If is it hiring help or listening to an assistant for defensive help? Something has to change, and I think that's fair to say. I think that's I'm assuming that's what that meeting was about. Uh, if if Kentucky wants to get any type of postseason success, getting talent is an issue. Uh, but getting the talent to fit to what they want to do seems to be something that that's changing, so that that that's eluding them right now. And and therefore, I think that's why I say something had to change. And I, I'm assuming the AD um, and and Kyle had to sit down and, and say, "Hey, what are we doing here?" And I think that's a fair mm-hmm. conversation uh, for both guys. And if there isn't a plan laid out, then there's options. I mean, let's 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 not act like Kentucky doesn't couldn't muster up the money to make a decision if they needed to. Um, finding the right guy, you know, you can say that anywhere. I mean, you know, Louisville struggled to find the right guy. Who who was who's no one's better to deal with the the, the blue the, the bright lights of Kentucky like Kyle is. I mean, uh, but right. Coach Kyle is, but he's got to figure out a way, man, to change some stuff. Uh, whatever it is, I mean, if it's if it's if it's if it's just I think delegating to an assistant for either side of the ball, something had, and maybe his voice changes and stuff, and, and maybe CEO it or something like that. There's just something different that I think has to happen. And if it's, if not, then I don't think it'll be fun for anybody. I don't think it'll be fun for him being there, and it won't be fun for Kentucky basketball because I think we're heading into a moment now with Kentucky basketball where with Cal that – it won't even matter how good of a year they have next year. People are wanting to see them advance in the March. They still want to be talking about Kentucky in the Sweet 16 and going forward. So they'll be kind of like Purdue was this year. But Purdue was dominant. We were all looking at Purdue like, man, are you going to get past the first round this year? That's, we know you're going, you're going to win the Big Ten. We expect you to do all this. And, and that's where Kentucky is right now. It's like, look, and they're not, they're not even dominating the SEC. Let's start mm-hmm. with that. So I don't even – that's unfair to make that comparison to Purdue. And and so uh, I, I think everything is fair. Those questions are fair, and, and we expect change, and I'm expecting to see something change. Whatever that is, we'll know soon enough. Jarrell, there's a, there's a couple of – I mean, there's more than a couple. There's lots of coaches, it feels like. Maybe it's the, the times we're in now, but it's, it's Cal who's got to change, uh, Penny in Memphis – uh, that's been the topics here in Memphis. Like you got to, and I guess as, I would ask you as uh, you know, somebody who's <clears throat> played and coaching the game, how realistic do you think it is that coaches can do that or are willing to do that, that they can look at themselves in the mirror and say, Hey, I, I F this up. I need to, you know, we're talking about 40, 50 year old men. How realistic is it to expect them to do that? You know, especially when they've achieved all Cal has achieved. I mean, I think it can be realistic, but it ultimately rests with the person that you're dealing with. And uh, obviously some coaches are just more stuck in their old ways and their old and whatever set of principles that they have. But man, as we all know, uh, and RC can speak to this too, from being a player to a coach or whatever it may be that, you know, the game evolves and, and things usually don't ever stay the same in sports. Uh, you know, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be some type of level of the game changing and evolving. And we kind of reached that point now. And I think he hit it uh, right on the head with, you know, this isn't this isn't the old days. And even to be honest with you, if you're looking back on it, it didn't it, it hasn't necessarily just turned out and worked great even then, where you think that you're just gonna get the top five star recruits every year, have them for a year. And uh, and win and win big, not the way that you want to win, not the way that Kentucky expects you to win, at least. And I think it has to come to a point in time where, you know, <clears throat> you can't just recruit off the pay off a piece of paper. Uh, you 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 can go after the best players. Obviously, they're Kentucky. They had a means to do so, and they'll get a lot of those guys because he is one of the he has shown to, to be one of the best recruiters uh, in the game and that the game has ever seen. But 
I think it's just more so about making that you get the right pieces that fit mm-hmm. together. Uh, and me just speaking in terms of like even now, just being a coach and stuff, and I'm dealing with, you know, obviously I'm not Kentucky and I don't have the same means, but we deal with a ton of high level players. And it's not always necessarily, I want the best guy at every position. It's about how will these guys fit and kind of mesh together? Like, do I have a vision for them playing off of one another? Are the, are the pieces going to fit? Uh, and I feel like they haven't done a great job. But then I also feel like they could do a better job of, of mixing it up, man, and, and going out to some of these guys that could fit their program through the portal. Uh, the game has gotten older. The game has gotten older, man. It's, 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 you're not going to see guys winning when their top three or four best players are freshmen that haven't played on the highest stage before. So, I mean, I think that's just the reality of the situation. Uh, it's something that I'm sure he's probably not opposed to changing up. I know he's still, and I, and I respect him for that because with this portal stuff, man, it's a lot of these high school guys that get kind of lost in the sauce. Uh, and, and, you know, just the priority on the young feet now with the four and five star guys isn't the same as it was before because, like I said, guys are on a shorter leash. They're trying to win now. They don't have time to develop and wait on guys to get better and show that they're ready to play at that highest level so i respect them for that but it's like man you know you got to switch it up because at the end of the day it's kentucky and they they're used to hanging banners man and getting national championships and anything short of that is going to seem kind of like a shortcoming guys let's be honest if 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 it if we're if we're using the word arrogance then you should be then and this isn't just toward coach kyle this is to anybody if you're using the word arrogance they should be fired anyway because it ain't about you it's about the kids anyway. So, or it should be. So, in, in your staff and everybody else. So, I, I don't, I would be, I'm very careful about using the word arrogance or if I call somebody or make that assumption with a coach. Because if, they, if they're that, then then they need to go. Because you're, you're responsible for so many people's careers. Hey, you mm-hmm. know, staff members, assistant staff members, everybody on that staff is, is tied to that coach. The players, it's not just the players. It's their families, their wives. Like, you, if, if if arrogance is, is a word we're describing, the if you have to describe your head coach as arrogance, you better get the hell out of there because you're on bar time. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I've been covering college basketball full time, you know, for, for 10, 11, 12 years. And, and I remember a time where, I mean, and, and, and you guys both know this, both, you know, RC back when you played in this in the sixties and seventies and Jarrell, you were obviously a little more recently. <laughs> but it was it was a much different process. It was, you know, coach got to know mom and dad like early on, ninth, tenth grade. Like coach knew everything about you, your family, your your everything, right? And it was a every time you sat at that table and you put a hat on and you made that choice, it was the culmination of a three to four year process in most cases, not always, but in most cases. And RC now, man, coaches ain't even seeing these dudes. Bro, they're they're recruiting on fit, they're they're watching ESPN plus tape. It ain't even it, 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 you don't you don't know these guys. And you get them on can and you, you talk to them on the phone, you FaceTime them, whatever, but it, it you don't get the chance to put in that real equity and getting to know the kid. And so you might just mess around and be surprised when that kid shows up on campus like, oh buyer's remorse for real this ain't what i signed up for i mean that's that that's fair and it's true but that's part of the job now right part of the job is 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 what is saying you know this is what we're about and talking to you about what you're about my job is to decide and your job is to decide that about me and you you ask questions you ask enough questions you ask the right people enough questions you'll have a general idea but when you say, hey, this is how you run your program, you hold the kid to it, then it is what it is. Like that, that, that we're not reinventing the wheel here. That part of it hadn't changed. Are, right. Can you are kids coming to your school and sitting on your bench anymore? They're not. We know that. Like, like, you know what right. I mean? That, that's not it. So, so if you if it if you got if it's pay for play, then damn it, you got to figure out how much you got and how much it's gonna take for you to get the right kind of day, which your what your money says, get your money right. And say, hey man, I got to get this kind of kid. Either way, the right kind of kid, and 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 that's it. It isn't, you know, you got to figure that out. That's just part of the job, man. And everybody got to deal with that. You know who has figured out, Jarrell, is is a guy that's still playing 
uh, this weekend. That's Kelvin Sampson. Uh, he was here in Memphis in the first two rounds, and I couldn't believe this, but it I, it sounds true to me. Only two players from his actual rotation over the last 10 years transferred out. That's it. Two guys, Mills and uh, Tremont Mark. Everybody else has put the time in, come in as a freshman and stayed there. So I don't know how he does it, Jarrell, but they got that would be the blueprint. Just be more like Kelvin Sampson and keep guys in your program. Man, he go he goes and get, gets guys that fit his culture though. Like, how many guys have you seen playing for Kelvin Sampson extended minutes who don't fit the mold of what he wants in basketball players? So you know, uh, and I, and that's one of the things that get overlooked in this whole process. I think, you know, in my opinion, retention of your own players, your good players, is more important sometimes than adding pieces. So. Uh, you know, he's able to get his guys, he's able to keep his guys, and they seem to love playing for him. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's amazing to watch. All right, when we get back, we're going to pick our Sweet 16 here. We're going to get these guys on the record starting tomorrow in the Sweet 16. We'll go through every single game, and we'll start – let's go in chronological order. It's just that simple. Randolph Childress, Jerome McNeil, John Martin, here with you on Field of 68 After Dark. Back after this. Whether you are a world-class athlete or a podcaster like myself, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. After a six-month season loaded with cross-country travel and late nights, I can promise you that proper recovery is a priority for me these days. That is why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of The Field of 68. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers that's powered by the Energy Enhancement System, or the EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Whether you're here in New Jersey or at hundreds of other locations across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Are you interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Well, all you got to do is go to unifiedhealing.com slash field to learn more and find a center near you. You can find that link in the description below. That's unified, U-N-I-F-Y-D, healing.com slash field. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before you undertake a new healthcare regimen, including the EE system. Welcome back to Field of 68 After Dark. I'm John Martin. Tonight, we have an ACC legend, Randolph Childress. We have a Big East legend, Jarrell McNeil. We're talking all things NCAA tournament. Who is better prepared and equipped to talk about NCAA tournament basketball than these two guys? But before we get into it, i got to let you know that these predictions and bold picks are presented by Vaulted, the app that allows you to participate in daily cash prize pools without an entry fee. By using the Vaulted Challenge feature, you can prove you're smarter than your friends. All you got to do is download the Vaulted app spe spelled V-L-T-E-D to challenge your friends, store your predictions, and join daily cash prize pools without an entry fee. Let's go. Kicking off Arizona versus Clemson. Arizona, are we just picking these? We're picking these straight up, right? Trevor, are we doing it against the spread? Okay. <clears throat> Some of these, it's like, yeah, it's a little cheap, but here, here, here you go, RC. We'll start with you. If you want, if you want to get spicy, yes, Quentin, you can see it. Seven and a half. Uh, Arizona is favored over Clemson tomorrow night. Who goes through here? Man, I'll tell you what. If I'm gambling, I'm taking Clemson and in, in the points. Um, hell of a game, man. It's gonna be hard out west. You hear about? You heard about Clemson's travel? They got home at two in the morning. I think Monday and had a four o'clock afternoon flight back to LA um, with travel. Hmm. Um, I, I think this game goes down. If PJ Hall is making jumpers, if he's making a couple of threes from the top of the key, Clemson can give Arizona all they want, man. And, you know, I, I, I like both coaches, both programs. Obviously Arizona's the favorite and, and it's going to be hard to pick in those guys being out West. 
Um, but I, I, I think this Clemson team is playing his best basketball. Chase Hunter's getting, getting, it, it's just playing the way I thought he'd played the beginning of the year, I, you know, and now he's the level of desperation has taken over. This guy had been there all year. Who wins the backcourt? I think wins this matchup. You know, we know about Arizona's backcourt, but Joe Girard, who hasn't shot it very well in the tournament, if he can pick it up, then, 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 you know, I, that, that's a hell of a game. What do you got, Jarrell? Who you like? First, I'm with you on that, RC. That uh, that seven and a half is too high. Uh, I think it's definitely going to be a close game. Uh, a bit of a contrast of styles, a little bit, but I'm rolling. Uh, I'm rolling with Arizona in this one. Uh, I think at the end of the day, like he said, uh, I think Chase Hunter's been playing his ass off since the tournament started. Uh, he gives them a different dynamic and uh, and really makes them a dangerous team. Uh, and it should be an interesting matchup. Just even the front courts as well as the back courts. Uh, P.J. Hall and Shefflin are two kind of rough and rugged dudes. Uh, they're pretty physical. They like, you know, they got a good chemistry playing off each other too with some interior pass and stuff. Uh, and Hall obviously can step out and shoot it a little bit. Uh, but Balo has been the force all year long, so I think he's more than equipped. Uh, him and Keyshawn Johnson to kind of handle it. Uh, but I'm, I think the X factor of the game is going to kind of be what Boswell we get. Uh, I think we know what Caleb Love is going to be Caleb Love. Uh, Boswell just so up and down sometimes, man. And uh, one night he's he's going for 20, and next night he's only taking like three attempts. So I think they'll need him to play well just to kind of level things out. But I'm rolling with Arizona. Yep, it'll be zoning for me. And uh, you know what? I, I don't even mind laying the seven, seven and a half. Um I think Clemson benefited from a 19% three-point shooting effort from New Mexico. And then Jacoby Walter, who's an 85% free throw shooter, clanks two, not one, but two. They're to tie it up there late. I mean, and they also shot 25%, one of the better offensive teams in the country. Maybe that's a, a function of Clemson's defense. I mean, I guess that's possible, but uh, I would just have to – I'd have to roll Arizona here. Uh, that's the look for me. But I definitely think they win the game. All right, moving right along. UConn, San Diego State, a rematch from the national title game. UConn, an even bigger favorite than they were a year ago. Uh, UConn, minus 10.5 versus San Diego State, RC. Uh, is the question just whether or not San Diego State can stay in this one? I, I, I think this will be tough for them. Uh, someone other than than um, Lamont Butler, we know Jaden Ledee has been great. I mean, he's been a grown man. Someone other than Lamont Butler got to make a shot for for and score. I mean, it, it, I just don't see who's the third or fourth guy going to be for San Diego State. You're not going to lock UConn down and limit them and jump the game up. You're going to have to score to beat them. So, uh, you know, if they don't do that, it could be another boat race. What you got, Jarrell? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one, RC. Uh, I just don't think they got enough offense to keep pace with UConn. Uh, the D has been great, uh, but he's he's the only player on their team. These guys got one player on their team that's averaging double figures, and it's him. Uh, and that's not going to be enough, I feel like, to beat UConn, even on a bad night for UConn. They'll be able to put up enough points to kind of stretch this thing out. And, uh, you know, obviously they'll try to muck it up and make it close. And San Diego State has been a good team the last couple of years, but – I think they probably get overwhelmed a little bit in this one. Yeah, it's a little annoying that UConn is just not going to be tested at all um, until the Elite <laughs> Eight. Like, it's kind of sickening. Everybody was like, oh, what a horrible draw. They got the we worst hope, draw of the tournament. We, we hope. Tested, we hope, the Elite Eight. Right. Right. Yeah. Hey, real quick, RC, they didn't. They couldn't even beat Yale, so maybe it's a stupid question. But it, it was supposed to be on paper Auburn here. Would they have – Given UConn a little bit more of a scare, did they have the personnel to do that maybe or or with the I, same? I thought they did. I thought they had the – more importantly, I thought they had the depth. I thought right. they were – I thought they had the depth, the second unit to be able to stay in the game and, and toughness to to make it interesting. You know, I don't I don't know if I yeah. would have favored them, but right. Katie Johnson could have went nuts. You just – there were so many X factors for them that could have made it appealing. Um you know, San Diego State has had a hell of a year. The Aztecs been good all year, but but I I, I don't like them in this matchup at all. Yeah, I, no 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 chance for me. It's UConn all the way. That's a locomotive. 
All right. Uh, mirror images probably here of each other. North Carolina, four and a half point favorite over Alabama. Total uh, ridiculous. I have a hole in my roof now, 173 and a half. Uh, <laughs> up to four and a half now, what's four, uh, RC? Uh, UNC here? Can Alabama, you know, go nuclear from three? What do you think? If they do, they that's their chance of beating them. I, I do like Carolina. Uh, I, I like their their overall team defense. Uh, they they have earned that one seed. I, I wish it wasn't so far west for those guys because I think inevitably that matchup against Arizona out west can be an issue. But they're there. Um, they're deserving of it. Uh, the thing that scares you about BAM is what they're capable of three point line. You know they can they can they can just go crazy. You can't let them get 14, 15 threes, free throws and layups. You just can't do it. So Carolina, when they've needed to have been challenged, they've answered the bell. Um, more than enough defensive perimeter strength to to be effective against Alabama. So I'm going with the Hills. What do you think, Jarrell? Yeah, I'm rolling with North Carolina as well. Um, I think they'll cover that four and a half. Uh, and I would probably even take the over, man. Obviously, the two teams that could really fill it up. Uh, North Carolina has been a lot more stable defensively, obviously, than Alabama. Uh, but, you know, Alabama, they just, you know, they, they, they like to play fast. They get up and down, and they can put up points, and they can get hot in a hurry, man. But they just don't guard anybody. Uh, and with a team like North Carolina, they're too talented for you not to uh, to kind of buckle down in that other end and try to get some stops. You're not going to beat them just trying to outscore them, I don't think. Uh, but I am looking forward to some of the matchups with the game inside of the game. Uh, R.J. Davis and uh, and Sears, I think that little matchup would be a good one to look at. Uh, yep. And eventually, I think that uh, that North Carolina will win out too, just with the interior play from uh, Baycott in England. So unless uh, unless Grant Nelson kind of steps up and has a good game or a really big game for Alabama, I think they're going to be in trouble. Yeah, I kind of think this one has the chance to get ugly. I'm going to be honest with you. I think Alabama fans should be really happy. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it could. I, I think it could. I think Alabama I, I think Alabama fans should be really happy that they're in this spot. I mean, to make a sweet 16 run with this roster is actually a really good job by Nate Oates, no doubt about it. You can say w- whatever you want to say about matchups, luck. That's part of the tournament, man. That's why you got to get there. But the road ends here, no doubt. I mean, Grant Nelson's going to foul out in six minutes. I mean, it, it just is what it is. Man. He's he going to be able to stay on the floor, and, that, and that's what it's going to look like. So North Carolina does what Alabama does, and they do it way better, and they're better on the interior. I just don't see a single spot on the floor where Alabama is better or really even close. So I think there's real margin here. So I'm going North Carolina in a blowout. I don't think this one will be interesting at all. Um, this one, however, fellas, will be. This is the game of the night. This this has the chance to be the game of the entire Sweet 16. Iowa State, Illinois, the two versus the three. Iowa State ever so slightly favored, minus one and a half. RC, it is the classic contrast. On one side, you have the high-flying Illini that will hang 90 on your grandma, and then you got Iowa State, the best defensive team in America. They tell me defense wins championships, but can it win a Sweet 16 matchup against the Illini here? This is the hardest damn game to pick. If, if I, I, I do not want to bet this game if I was betting and I'm not. So I, I, I'm going to stay – I'm going to go with the Illini here only because I do think as good as Iowa State is on the defensive end of the floor, they have had some offensive struggles at times. And I don't think you can stop Terrence Shannon getting downhill in transition. I don't give a damn how good your defense is. That's that that athlete, that size, that experience, his ability to make shots. Uh, Dane Danger's playing well. Coleman Hawkins, I think if he can be he can be a factor. I, I just not by much. I, I like the align on this one. I think I, I'm I think I'm rolling with you on that one too, RC. I think it'll obviously be a, a con, another game that's gonna be a major contrast in styles. Uh I am interested just to see what Iowa State will kind of do. I don't anticipate on them just coming coming out and letting uh, Terrence Shannon Jr. beat them by themselves. Uh, so I, I do think it'll put some pressure on Illinois to try to make some of those other guys step up and uh, and make plays and make shots when it's not just him, even though he's been playing at a really high level. But it'll be fun to watch. 
I'm going to go uh, Iowa State only because they're the only team in America that's beaten Houston twice. And that's the, that's all I've got. I mean, that's the only thing I can lean on here. And I'm That's all you need. That. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, but it's need. honestly, it makes me sick. Like, I, I'm in a pretzel over it. You know, I, I can absolutely see that going either way. All right. We're going to come back and preview the other half of the Sweet 16. We got RC, we got Jarrell McNeil back with Field 68 After Dark after this. By now, you guys have surely heard about Autograph, an app founded by Tom Brady with the intention of disrupting the way that fans consume content covering their favorite teams. This is how the app works. All of the podcasters, bloggers, and digital creators covering a team have their content sent to that team's page in the Autograph app. Instead of having to bounce from site to site or trying to navigate the safer workspaces on Twitter, you can just scroll through Autograph. This isn't a hard sell. This is the truth. I am a UConn fan, and I use the Autograph app to keep up with the writers I read and the pods that I listen to about UConn basketball. The best part is that every piece of content that you consume gives you reward points. The more you get, the more chances you have at things like discounted tickets to games and the grand prize, a trip to the LA Regional and a spot in a suite for the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight games. Here's the best part. We've partnered with Autograph to donate $1 to the V Foundation every time someone downloads the app using the code F68 with a minimum of $2,500 getting donated. The app is free. So download, use the code F68, help us raise a little bit of money for cancer research and give Autograph a try. I promise you it will be worth it. And while we're here, a quick reminder, make sure that you subscribe to The Daily. We have new landing pages with deep dives into each coaching change, as well as a tracker that provides scouting reports on the transfers that have entered the portal that you are going to want to know about. Hit the link below to subscribe. Welcome back to Field of 68 After Dark. Remember, we're going to head over to Stadium for last call in about 14 minutes. So if you've got some questions, got time to get those in, and we'll answer them over there on Stadium for last call. Uh, we've been picking the Sweet 16, of course, presented by Vaulted, uh, and we have the back half of the Sweet 16, which uh, is going to start on Friday. Let's kick it off with Marquette NC State. We'll start with Jarrell. We'll mix it up. We'll give the we'll give the Marquette product first crack at it. <laughs> yeah, man. Marquette <laughs> minus six and a half uh, against the ACC. I mean, this is amazing. The ACC's NC State. Uh, what do you like here, Jarrell? What do you think? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm rolling with the home team on this one. Uh, and it's kind of sad that it, it ended up being NC State, man, because they've, they've been fun to watch uh, on this run that they've made, uh, be playing their way into the NCAA tournament and then getting to the Sweet 16. Uh, and, and, I, and I like their team. They got some really good guys, some good players, some characters over there. But at the end of the day, I think uh, – I don't think I don't think they'll have enough offense to keep pace with Marquette. Uh, I think we got some favorable matchups, especially with our backcourt with Kolick and uh, and Cam Jones the way he's been playing, and also just the dynamic in the matchup. I feel like the couple matchups we'll have to watch is just you know uh, Stevie will have to do a good job on uh, on DJ Horn and trying to limit him, him and Chase Ross, and then. Uh, I do like the favorable matchup with also against uh, against Burns, only because uh, it'll be hard playing out of a lot of those DHOs and quick screens and go screens. But also, especially with him handling the ball out top a lot, so I'll be it'll be interesting to see NC State's game plan for that uh, and just how they'll try to limit and stop those guys, uh, Kolek and Cam, from getting downhill. Uh, especially going to their left hands. But, uh, you know, as of right now, I haven't seen anybody that's had an answer for it yet. So I think uh, I think the Golden Eagles roll in this one. RC, what you think? I want to go against them so bad. I really do. I would love to call <laughs> Jarrell so much trash. I would love to call him and just talk so much trash and be able to text him. I, I, I just don't – I think it's a bad matchup. Um the matchup that concerns me is Burns on the defensive end of the floor against Igadoro, his ability to put it on the floor, but more importantly against against uh, Kolek and Jones and ball screens. And they can go to Middlebrook defensively. They're better, but then they lose so much. They lose their point guard in the half-court yeah. set with Burns. So 
Uh, I'd be curious to see if they're going to try to do something different, maybe run some zones or something to try to say. I just don't like the matchup with Burns on that end of the floor and ball screens with Igadoro and the guard play of Marquette. So that, that that's just the one team I don't like the matchup for NC State. As hot as they are right now, the matchup I don't like. I, I just think the uh, big boy, it's big boy season. He's thriving. I mean, I, I'm definitely going to take the points. I don't know if NC State wins. That's going to be tough. But, man, I, ain't gonna, I mean, I ain't going to sit here and act like Marquette wasn't playing with fire against Colorado and another fellow big man. We saw it can be a little bit of a struggle for them. There was a moment where I felt like Colorado was going to win that game. I mean, it was it was it was brief, but there was an opening there. So I don't know. I'm going to take the I'm going to take the two plus possessions here. Marquette probably wins, but I think that's too many points. Uh, all right. Purdue Gonzaga. Uh, Gonzaga, of course, off that molly whopping of Kansas. Purdue just steamrolling everybody. Uh, this Purdue team is different. They're in the second weekend. Can they get to the Elite Eight? Can they break through RC? I think it's Purdue. I think this whole Midwest bracket is set up for Purdue because everyone has a, a, a big guy. You know, they don't. They've they've survived the the region of worrying about potentially playing small ball and. And everything else you're going to play against uh ek graham ek you're going to play against um uh, Paul Brenner, and you're going to play against uh a do so they're going to get three big men that that will allow them that's not going to stretch the floor too much that's going to allow Edie to be in the paint and he's just the most dominant guy in the paint man so i i think this bracket is set up for purdue to, to get to the final four rc yeah. uh I'm with you on that one, RC. I'm going Purdue as well too, but I do think it'll be I do think it'll be a little bit closer probably than some of us uh, are expecting. Uh, five and a half points isn't a lot. I do think Gonzaga kind of has the roster to make up to kind of hold up at least somewhat defensively. Zach Eady is going to be Zach Eady, but I feel like um, if I can hand in there, if he can hang in there and battle him without getting in foul trouble too early. That they uh, that some of the other guys, those perimeter oriented oriented guys, they can win some of those matchups and those battles. So I think it'll end up being a close one. But uh, I think you spot on with that. We they haven't. I think their kryptonite is a small ball. So long as it's somebody out there, every lineup that they got, they got somebody out there that Edie can guard. That they don't. He don't. He doesn't have to worry about chasing to the three point line. Uh, the matchup is gonna kind of favor Purdue. Yeah, small ball's coming. It's coming real soon, but it ain't gonna be on Friday night. It ain't going to be on Friday night. And so uh, they did go to the Elite Eight in 2019. I think they get back. Um, and then and then it gets real fun from there. But I do think they get this one and they get back to the Elite Eight. All right, here's a good one. Here's a really good one. Houston, Duke. Houston minus three and a half off of just an absolutely ridiculous game. The first team in NCAA tournament history since 1987 to win a game where four or more players fouled out uh, not to mention the 46 free throws they put AM at the line for, not to mention the 26 offensive rebounds they gave up. Still find a way to win the game, RC. Duke smacks James Madison. Who wins this one? I think it depends on how, how it's officiated. If it's officiated yeah. anything like the second half of that AM game, I thought that game was two different halves. I thought the first half, you could have charged either team with assault. And and it was so physical. And then I thought the whistle started blowing in the second half. And I, I think if obviously if it's physical, it favors Houston. And if you if it's a, they're allowed to play and freedom and move and whatever. I think overall skill wise, it's I think Duke you know has has a better chance. Um, Duke Duke's dinged up right now, man. I, I would Jalen Blake's took a fall. I I don't know if he's going to play or what his status is. They need him. Um, Caleb Foster's out. So having said that, uh, but they still pose a threat. Neither team is deep. Uh, yep. But how the game is officiated is going to dictate who wins this game. Uh, but I, I, outside looking at it, I'd say Houston. But I think this if the game is allowed, the Duke's allowed to move and freedom to move, and I like Duke chances. Drew? I think – I think Duke is Duke. They may just be, and I know for all the shit that we've given them this year about how they they they're just soft and they haven't put it all together. But I think at this point that they might be, 
the most dangerous team left in the in the, in the other last sixteen teams. Uh, they've played they've played well. They've seen to kind of found something over the last couple of games. Obviously, competition has been a little bit different, but at the end of the day, that's the NCAA tournament. But man, I'm rolling with Houston. Uh, it's partially because I picked them to go to a Final Four, but uh, <laughs> I think I think Duke would give them all that they can handle, and I don't necessarily love the matchups uh, just across the board for Houston. I will, and, I, and and RC hit it on the head. How this game is officiated, and you'll be able to kind of tell the first five minutes into the game. That's going to be a huge determining factor of what happens in this game. Like if they come out there and they, and they don't allow Houston to be as physical as they as they usually are on ball and playing defense, uh, I think it favors Duke a little bit more. Hey, hey Jarrell, uh, let's be honest. Let them play. Let, let's be honest. This is a chance for Duke to answer the call that everybody's been saying about him. Everybody's been calling him soft all year long. This is the game that they can show up and be like, look, if you beat Houston, yep. you, you, you get rid of all that. that, that that's just yeah, the bottom line. Soft. You can't beat Houston and be soft, right? You can't be, you can't be Houston if you're soft. <laughs> they got, they got to put all that to rest. Everybody's yep. been dancing no, around I, it, trying to be real political about it, nice about it. They called them soft, and they got a chance to, to to stand up, punch Houston back in the mouth, and win this game. And they won't. Um. <laughs> 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 I mean, look. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Right on one side, you have you have the trust fund. <laughs> Uh, grandma's inheritance. We're gonna make TikToks. We're gonna paint our fingernails, right? And, and on the other trust, side, <laughs> on the other side, you got some. You got dogs, bro, up and down the floor, man. Who, who will beat your ass? They, they ain't on TikTok, bro. Hey, they, they gotta be ass. tough one day, John. They just gotta be tough one I day. I don't even think the Houston minutes. players have cell phones, bro. All right, I mean, this is this is <laughs> this gonna be a biblical <laughs> ass whooping. This is gonna be a, a biblical ass whooping. So I'm excited uh, to see it. America's going to love it. All right, last one. Tennessee <laughs> versus Creighton. Tennessee minus two and a half, RC. I think this is the hardest one that we've discussed. I think this goes against Illinois, Iowa State. Um, hard to go against Tennessee. They win ugly. I think Creighton offensively can be a little bit better. I'm going to go – I'm going to go Tennessee. I just think they they're gonna they got I think offensively they're gonna figure it out and play better offensively. I think their offense was still in Knoxville. Uh Jarrell. Yep. Yep, I'm with you on that. I'm going Tennessee. Um uh, I just don't think that Creighton has enough bodies to throw at Connect. Uh I think they'll start it off with Alexander on them. That's really the only good matchup. Uh, and then he may get in foul trouble, and then who do you go to after that? They had all – think all three of those guys, man, played extended minutes the first two games, man. So it'll be hard for Creighton. I'm rolling with Tennessee. I'm going to go Creighton because I'm, I'm spooked by that performance against Texas from three. Uh, that worries me a lot. But, hey, we're going to continue this conversation over on Stadium with Last Call. Field of 68 is going to be back tomorrow from the Sweet 16. For Jarrell McNear, for Randolph Tilders, I'm John.